Welcome, I'm Claire Schaefer. Today I'm going to take you behind the scenes to look at this elegant dress by Charles Frederick Worth. This dress is part of an innovative online exhibition on the website of the Museum of the City of New York. Don't worry, I'll provide the link later. Worth and Manbouche is an innovative online exhibition on the website of the Museum of the City of New York. It focuses on the designs of Charles Frederick Worth and Manbouche. Manbouche was born Maine Rousseau Boucher. The online exhibition features 119 designs in the museum's permanent collection. It was curated by Phyllis Magidson. The most exciting element is you can watch this exhibition online anytime you want. I have many favorites and hope to show you more another day. Today, I shall focus on the simple but stunning gown from 1866 or 67. The gown was a gift to the museum from Richard H. L. Sexton and Eric H. L. Sexton. It was worn by the great-grandmother, Mrs. Benjamin Talbot Babbitt, or the grandmother, Mrs. Frederick E. Hyde, of the donors. Charles Frederick Worth and Otto Boberg established the House of Worth and Boberg in 1858. Worth was a creative partner. The label is stamped with gold to show the name and address of the new Couture House and the Imperial Coat of Arms. This latter indicates that the firm was a purveyor to the Emperor. Recognized as the father of haute couture, Worth is known for his lavish use of fabrics and attention to fit. He is considered the first designer to create a variety of designs which were shown on live models. Clients could see the collection, select the designs they liked, then order custom-made dresses to fit their measurements. This early Worth design was created in 1866 or 1867. It is a splendid example of Worth's ability to design simple gowns as well as easily and masterfully as extravagant ones. Fabricated in rib silk, it is a typical mid to late 1860s silhouette. Both the design and size indicate that the dress was made for a girl or a young woman. The two-piece dress has a closely fitted waist-length bodice and floor-length skirt with a short train. The separate bodice and skirt are an early example of Worth's innovative use of modular components. The bodice is short, with the wide neck and self-fabric collar. The neckline, collar, and short sleeves were trimmed with self-fabric ruffles, bows, and a sash. Pleated tulle was applied to the neckline and sleeves. Like many Worth designs, the back is particularly attractive. The skirt's fullness was pulled to the back with cartridge pleats, which are hidden under the bows. The edges of the collar ruffles were cut with small scallops and left unfinished. The pleated belt is fastened under the bow. The sleeves were trimmed with self-fabric cuffs and bows. Bias bindings finish the edges of the cuffs with miters at the corners. The miters are folded, but not sewn. The bodice has two collars, a smaller collar at center front and a larger collar over the shoulders and back. Like the cuffs on the sleeve, the collar points also have folded miters. The center front panels are cut on the straight grain with the seam at center front, and the side front panels are cut on the bias instead of the usual straight grain. This would allow the bodice to fit more smoothly without wrinkling. The ruffles were applied to the edges of the collar with running stitches. Then the decorative bias band was sewn over them. 
When the ruffle is held back, you can see the tape on the edge of the collar. The tape was sewn with long running stitches. The seam was machine stitched. Worth was one of the first designers to use a sewing machine. The seam was first machine stitched and pressed to one side. Then it was stitched again close to the seam. The dye in the threads have darkened with age. When the collar is held back, you can see the tool underlining and the other side of the blue tape. There is an occasional small French tack to keep the collar from flying up. The collar is unusual and imaginative. It has points in the front, narrows over the shoulders with a deep scoop at center back. On the panel back, both the back and the side panels were cut on grain. The bodice was fastened with a center back lace-up. Notice that the lacing eyelets were staggered. The eyelets were finished with whip stitches. The dye in the threads have darkened with age. The ruffle was pleated one half inch from the top and sewn to the collar edge with short running stitches. The decorative tubing, which covers the stitches, was cut on the bias and made by hand. When the back collar is held back, you can see the tool underlining. The edges of the collar were folded over the tool. At the ends, they were secured with whip stitches. At the neck edge, the seam allowance on the collar was folded over the tool and secured with a running stitch that zigzagged from the seam allowance to the tool. The collar was sewn to the neckline of the bodice with running stitches. The waist edge was finished with Worth's signature double pipings, which were sewn by hand. The lower binding covers the bodice hem and the seam of the upper binding. Fell stitches secure the upper edge. The bodice had been let out at the waist. This was not difficult since the double pipings had been sewn on by hand. At center back, small self-fabric extensions were added to lengthen the piping trim. The fabric for the extensions could have been provided when the dress was purchased, anticipating that the dress would need a later alteration or they might have been taken from the hem of the skirt. There is extra fullness on the waist day at center front, which would have made an alteration easier. Notice that the thread color is different on the cross stitches in one place than it is on the others. The bodice was underlined and has seven stays. The silk casings for the stays were sewn to the seam allowances by hand with short back stitches. There is a dark tuck at center front. The center front seam is cut with selvage edges near the neckline. The remaining seams are overcast by hand to prevent raveling. The edges of the pleated tool at the neck and sleeves were finished with silk bindings, which were sewn on with running stitches. The sleeves were sewn into the armholes by hand. At the underarms, the ends of the tool were sewn together with loose running stitches. Now let's take a look at the skirt. To minimize the fabric bulk at the waist, the full skirt was cut in gores with side front pleats. The front and sides are flat with the fullness pulled to the back with multiple cartridge pleats. There is an inseam pocket on the side. The waist is smooth between the pleats with a small amount of ease at the front and sides. More than 50 cartridge pleats were used to hold the fabric in place at the back. 
The skirt band was finished with a firmly woven cotton facing. A cream-colored silk pocket sack was sewn to the waistband facing with catch stitches. The museum tape shows the accession number, which indicates that the dress was given to the museum in 1962. The pocket sack was sewn to the seam allowances with running stitches. Some of the cartridge pleats were removed from the left back when the waist was let out. The waistband measures only 21 and 3 8 inches after the extension was added. This close-up of a couple of pleats shows how loosely they were sewn. The skirt hem has been faced with taffeta. The skirt might have been lengthened, or the original hem allowance could have been used to let out the waistband and pipings on the bodice. The skirt hem was interfaced with a crisp cotton fabric. The long skirt seams were sewn by hand with running stitches and left unfinished. The pleated belt was fastened at the waist and covered with a double bow. The double bow and streamers were sewn to one end of the belt. The streamers are 7 and 7 eighths inches wide and 17 inches long. The belt was pleated like a cummerbund with the pleats open at the top. The pleats were backed with a loosely woven fabric, like cheesecloth. The ribbon was not sewn at the edges. Petersham ribbon was used to finish the back of the belt. Petersham is a crisp ribbon woven with a lino weave. The ends of the sash were unraveled about four inches, divided into sections, and knotted attractively so that the fringe is three inches long. To read more about this fabulous collection, visit the Museum of the City of New York's website. I'm Claire Schaefer. Thank you for joining me today. If you have enjoyed this video, join my channel to see more interesting designs.